remember I talked about the terroir model, in a sense saying that, you know, that I, I was traveling in France. My wife is French, and both of our daughters are married to French people, and we visited one of their families, and he said, why don't we go to a vineyard and have some wine? And when we were there, they talked about the terroir, and they said, you know what makes the terroir is part our soil, the amount of clay, the amount of lava, the amount of sand, the amount of other things that went into that soil. That's what gives our grapes kind of their unique taste or flavor, that soil. But it's not just that. It's the amount of sunshine and rain that come down on that soil. But it's not just that. It's the, the people tilling the soil and their souls that go into that earth and into those grapes that make the terroir, that make the taste of the wine be what's so good about our wines. And I thought, you know, that's the way kids grow brains. It has those factors that play a role. And how can we focus on those to help have the very best terroir in a child in the way that they're growing? So level four might be thinking of more on the surface of the earth about behavioral interventions and family support and providing structure. Level one might be gene modification, which we're barely being able to do right now with CRISPR and other technologies, but I think there would be a lot of controversy about genetic engineering for autism to go away from autism. So we may not do too many level one interventions. But in this level two to four is where we're thinking about more on the surface things like speech and language and occupational therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. And at level down a little further, we're thinking about pharmacotherapy, using medications that can be helpful. And then more in that middle earth, we're thinking about biomedical or epigenetic interventions, nutraceuticals, uh, other things that affect processes that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. So if we're thinking about level four, surface of the earth, we're talking about behavioral treatments for autism. The one that's best known is ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis. And ABA actually encompasses a number of different treatments that are behavioral. The one that we often think of are discrete trial training. The ones that have to do with giving a candy or an M&M or something to the child when they do what we want or what we're hoping that they'll do. But it's been carried much further than that into things like teach, which has a kind of wrap around whatever works for the child, whatever they need, in a program developed in North Carolina, but now used everywhere in a way that's thoughtfully done. Or pivotal response training that was developed by the Kegels, who were at the time at University of California. Santa Barbara, where you try and find what's the kid's main interest, how do you catch their interest, and then use that to connect to them. So if they see a toy on the counter that they want to play with, and you take the toy up to your eye and get them to look at your eye and say toy, and then make them have to say toy before they get the toy, and to make eye contact with you, You've used that as a pivot to help them do the thing that you want, and then that can grow. There's also things like incidental teaching or floor time um, that are based on having a relationship. It's kind of another step, but if you were to picture floor time, you say if you get down on the floor, you get eye contact with the kid, you find out what they're thinking or feeling, and you connect with them in that way. And more and more, you help them learn reciprocity in that way back and forth. A model that has really developed to help kids that, with that process is called the Early Start Denver model. And it's been studied pretty extensively and has also shown that people that show progress with the Early Start Denver model also show changes in their EEG and in their brain uh, scans. 
that would suggest the brain's actually been changed. So these processes are not just the surface of the earth. They may start there, but they seep down into the earth and, in a sense, re-sculpt neurons, change the way the brain processes are working. So level four interventions, surface of the earth interventions, good to do, but not the only thing to do. We can think next about getting to the next level of thinking about medications that might help kids. So we'd mentioned that ADHD is not uncommon in people with autism. Early studies suggested that kids on the spectrum tended to have more side effects and the effectiveness was not quite as good. But more recent studies have said that going low, starting low and going slow can result in uh, improvement in these kids that have ADHD that's co-occurring with autism and can make a big difference. The studies, most of the studies have been with stimulants, but there are some smaller studies using atomoxetine, Stratera, that also suggest improvement, but as with stimulants, less so than kids that had just ADHD alone, but still enough improvement to suggest it might be worth trying for kids that have a significant problem with inattention impulsivity and hyperactivity. SSRIs have long been thought to be helpful for autism, particularly for the obsessive compulsive features and anxious features. And there were several small studies suggesting that it made a difference, and a study with adults finding that it does, but a large study with 149 children, five to 17 with autism, found no significant difference between placebo and citalopram. Now some people have said maybe citalopram wasn't the best SSRI, or maybe they didn't use a high enough dose, or maybe um, they didn't use the right outcome measure, and it work, didn't work particularly well for repetitive behaviors, but maybe it worked for anxiety. So. People still seem to use SSRIs with autism, but there's a question of how universally beneficial it is. Alpha-2 adrenergic agonists are actually blood pressure medications like clonidine and guanfacin. They uh, tend to relax the body through working on the norepinephrine or noradrenergic system. And there are limited trials suggesting that it's a benefit to kids with autism. Some, it may decrease their anxiety. Some, it may help with some of their sensory responses and decrease their irritability and stereotypy. Um, and it may also um, decrease hyperactivity. Antipsychotics, which are poorly named, uh, we wish that there were a better name because we don't just use them to treat psychosis, but they work on um, dopamine and serotonin, the atypicals work on both. And there's a double-blind trial with risperidone, several of them now, that led to the FDA giving approval for using risperidone for treating irritability and autism. And then they did the same, uh, did similar studies with aripiprazole, Abilify, and the FDA also gave approval for treating irritability in youth with autism for Abilify based on those very positive studies um, that were done multiple times. So a summary of medications working at level two in our terroir model is that stimulants work for some, start low and go slow. Antidepressants maybe help with anxiety, OCD, maybe not as much, but it, because based on one large, well-done trial, but there is one positive study with adults. Alpha adrenergic agonists, worth a try for anxiety, but there are limited studies. Anticonvulsants may help when kids have mood dysregulation, plus neurologic abnormalities, but again, there are limited studies. And antipsychotics may help with uh, irritability, uh, impulsivity, aggression. 
and risperidone and Abilify have indications, but there are other medications in that same class that may be a benefit as well. So the final section I'm going to talk about is what are call, often referred to as complementary and alternative medicine or complementary and integrative medicine. I think less and less we're liking the term alternative or complementary. It's as though these are the medications that you use or the supplements or things that you would use when you want to avoid using conventional medications. They don't work as well, but for those people that want to try them, they might as well because they don't do much harm. I think increasingly we're appreciating that these can affect processes that are not, not the usual ones that we're using conventional medications for, that used in to the wrong doses or for the wrong indication, they can cause difficulty and should be used by people that are skilled. But parents of kids with autism tend to uh, turn to these CAM or KIM treatments more frequently. Um, 28 to 82 percent of children with recently diagnosed autism use CAM. The main reasons that parents seem to choose this are related to their concerns about safety and adverse effects of prescribed medications. And they're discouraged because their physicians are not perceived as a knowledgeable resource in using these, at least their conventional physician. And too often, parents go to one set of doctors for their complementary and integrative treatments and they don't tell them that they're seeing a traditional doctor. And then they go to a traditional doctor uh, for their conventional treatments, but they don't tell them that they're seeing the other. And then they're having to make parents are having to make decisions without really having the input of their physicians. So we're hoping that people more and more become accepting of those different approaches and can engage in meaningful conversation with parents rather than just don't try that, it doesn't work, or don't listen to that doctor, he or she doesn't know what they're talking about. Things that are changing our paradigm, in a sense changing how we're thinking about how we're treating autism, are that we're finding autism is not just something that occurs in the brain, that these People with autism also have intestinal inflammation, digestive enzyme abnormalities, metabolic impairments, evidence of oxidative stress, immune problems that range from immune deficiency to hypersensitivity to autoimmunity. And in many cases, we can get improvements in these autistic symptoms by treating those symptoms with nutritional recommendations, perhaps with medication, and then addressing underlying medical conditions. So we're increasingly thinking of autism as a whole body disorder, especially a gut-brain disorder, not just a brain disorder. I'm going to mention just a few of the nutritional or Kim interventions or biomedical interventions that have good evidence for their usefulness. So, Melatonin is one <clears throat> that we um, find that in a number of studies, melatonin decreases the amount of time for kids with developmental disorders to fall asleep. They stay asleep better at the first part of the night, but they may not stay asleep through the night. There are some recent studies of controlled release melatonin that has a steadily decreasing dose throughout the night that may help kids sleep better throughout the night. It seems to have very few effect, minim, uh, side effects, and there may be additional benefits in social communication and stereotype behaviors, although some of that may be because the kids are sleeping better too. But there's evidence that melatonin makes a difference and that it seems to be safe and have few side effects. Vitamin D has had a lot of interest and seems to show some benefit and some rationale in indicating that kids that have low vitamin D levels 
may be more prone to also be associated with autism. Kids with autism tend to have lower vitamin D levels than typically developing kids. Kids with autism may not get out in the sun as much, may not <clears throat> do things where they get vitamin D in other ways, and there are studies that indicate that it makes a difference uh, in a small difference, not a big difference for kids with autism. We did a study of methyl B12. When I was first being interviewed to be the, direct, the executive director of the MIND Institute, the parents who had founded the MIND Institute and raised a large amount of money said what they really wanted in the person that was the executive director was somebody that would leave no stone unturned about what might cause autism or how it might be treated. They wanted me to do and make sure others were doing good science, but they wanted me and others to keep an open mind. Um, I said, great, and I went to some meetings and I heard people talk about different treatments that at first I was very skeptical of. And I said, what should I try? They said, well, we'd like you to study chelation for a randomized control trial. I said, you know, that's just too hard to do. What's next? They said, methyl B12. So we did two studies of methyl B12 and saw some kids show remarkable improvement. We've published both those studies, suggesting that the active separated from placebo and we saw changes in oxidative stress biomarkers that were greater in those kids that showed significant improve, improvement and started out lower in those that showed the most significant improvement as well. There has been several good studies of N-acetylcysteine, NAP, something you can buy over the counter, works on glutamate and is also an antioxidant. And it seems to be a benefit for self-injurious behaviors, for irritability. And the first study was a randomized control trial and showed that it separated. But there have been other trials that haven't been as positive or haven't been uh, uh, shown that same benefit. But many patients do seem to show a benefit from NAC, and it appears to have very, very few side effects and to be well tolerated. Omega-3s is another that shows a modest effect size. People get a little bit better, not wildly better, but a little better over time. And that's also been shown in moms who take it during pregnancy. The studies, because these effect sizes are so small, are hard to do because you need to hold people in a study for a long time you need to ask them to hold other things constant. And um, you need to, to watch these kids for, um, for a while to get to see that kind of large, and you need to have a lot of kids to show that they're uh, making a difference. Vitamin mineral supplements have a few studies saying that they make a difference, others that they don't. Diet. Uh, the studies have been very hard to do for the things like the casein gluten-free diet, but I have to tell you candidly that I know some parents that I hugely respect, that I know are very, very thoughtful, and tell me that the single most important thing they've done for their child with autism is a casein gluten-free diet. But I know many, many other kids that have been tried on the diet, full diet, that it didn't make any difference for, and studies suggest that it doesn't. So I think you need to find somebody motivated to use the whole diet for the whole family, to think about it carefully, but there are some studies that would indicate that maybe it makes a difference. We're increasingly looking at the microbiome, thinking about the health of that microbiome and using things like probiotics and even microbiota transfer therapy where uh, feces from healthy people are implanted in children who have a lot of GI symptoms and have abnormalities. And it seems to help them have healthy feces, but it also seems to improve their GI symptoms and their autism spectrum disorder symptoms that persist for eight weeks even after treatment in studies that have been done. 
There is a study that has just been completed using a pancreatic digestive enzyme that looks as though maybe it's positive since they're going to the FDA with it, but they haven't yet gotten FDA approval and they haven't yet published their results. But there's a suggestion that using this uh, digestive enzyme that helps break down large proteins that may irritate the lining of the gut and lead to GI symptoms also may have something to do with development of autism. Finally, there's a study looking at, the, finally, and what I'm going to talk about, uh, a study looking at vasopressin, which seems to help with autism. Um, vasopressin is related to oxytocin. It seems to improve socialization, and yet oxytocin has to be taken frequently with nose sprays or nasal cannula. This vasopressin lasts, you, so you can take it once a day. And there were results from a study in adults suggesting, at least on some measures, that the adults improved in their socialization measures with vasopressin. And now the company, Roche and Genentech, are doing studies in kids 5 to 7 and have done a study, or 5 to 17, and they have done a study with adults and they'll be doing another study with adults. And the first study with adults has been reported in a poster, but not yet in a publication. We've been really interested in this, in our, the way of thinking about how could nutritional supplementation or other interventions improve the resilience of kids with autism that could help them grow healthier bodies and healthier brains. And we've been doing it at a school called the Oak Hill School. And through some generous donors, we've been able to build an outcome study so that all our, of our interventions are measured. And we've been able to use things like metabolomics, a way through the urine that we can see metabolic byproducts that show changes when we try different nutritional supplements. Metabolomics looks at these thousands of metabolic byproducts that tend to cluster around the processes that I've been talking about before, like oxidative stress or mitochondrial health, and could show abnormalities that could help us know what kind of supplements or other things should we use to help this epigenetic process become more resilient and become healthier in its direction, and also help us know how to measure outcomes that could show whether what we were doing was working and correcting the process. We did a study with sulforaphane, which is concentrated broccoli sprout extract that was developed to treat oxidative stress in cancer. And it was also found to affect heat shock protein. And a really thoughtful researcher said, you know, kids with autism tend to do better when they have a fever, heat shock protein. I wonder could this work, this sulforaphane, with kids with autism? And he led a group in a study that showed active separated from placebo. And we did a study at Oak Hill School looking at metabolomics as an outcome measure and saw that the children improved, and they improved on the ABC particularly, but some on the SRS, and this uh, um, uh, social responsiveness scale, but they also showed the group that improved the most showed improvement in things like oxidative stress and neurotransmitters and sphingomyelin metabolism. What I would suggest is happening in a certain way or a model that I like to think of is, you know, that the person with autism is a person underneath that autism. You may look and see the autism, but underneath that veil of autism is a kid. And I think anybody who's come to know somebody well who has autism begins to appreciate that kid that's in there. Certainly the way they come out is influenced by autism, and some of the things that are influenced are fun and delightful, and you can like the way, love the way that they are in those ways, but there's a sense that autism created a veil 
over this child and, and help them form the way they did. What we hope is that these kinds of interventions can lift the veil of autism so we can reach in and pull the child out, pull that person out from under the veil. But we can lift the veil by making the body healthier, making it more resilient, and improving their outcomes. That's done by working at all levels looking at the genetic, neurology, GI, and medical symptoms, looking at an, uh, another level at using speech and OT, occupational therapy, using behavioral interventions that may seem to be affecting the surface of the earth, but penetrating deep down, treating associated symptoms that are interfering with pharmacology, and then thinking about these biomedical interventions like melatonin, omega-3, vitamin D3, probiotics, digestive enzymes, and some of the others, plus many more that I haven't mentioned, um, that would play a role in helping the body be healthier and more resilient. 